Well, good morning. Welcome to Irving Bible Church. My name is Craig. I'm so glad you're here. Those of you that showed up in the room, those of you watching online, thanks for joining in. It's already been such a great morning having all the kids in here with the palm branches. Uh, Many of you are coming off of spring break, whether that was this last week or the week before. Um, And I've just been thinking, I think maybe you parents of young children might agree with me. I'm not sure that break is the right word for that week. Um, It's funny, we own a preschool, and so uh, on the Friday before spring break, the parents that come into our school, they're all excited, right? It's spring break. We're going to take our kids on vacation, or we're going to just stay at home with our kids all week. It's going to be amazing. And then the week passes, and you get to the Monday after spring break, and you just watch them as they come into the school, kind of like this. Their eyes are glazed over, they look exhausted, they look defeated, they're like, here, just take our kids. And uh, you know, I hear comments like, wow, that was an exhausting week. We didn't get anything done. I can't wait to get back to work. And so I'm just thinking maybe we ought to rename that week instead of spring break, how about we call it the spring disruption? Because Webster's defines a disruption like this. Um, It is a uh, break or interruption in the normal course or continuation of some activity or process. And I think that pretty well describes what that week is for a lot of families with young children. Now, Kathy and I are empty nesters. All of our children have moved out. We have grandchildren and children in the area, but nobody living with us. And so you would think at our age, maybe this week really was a break. But this spring break for us was amazing, um, exhausting. It was so much fun. And did I say exhausting? Because during this week, uh, we had a little disruptor in our home. I brought his picture. His name (laughs) is George. He's eight months old. He lives down in San Antonio. He's our grandson. And he came up with his mom and dad and spent the week with us, the week that I will call the Great Disruption. Now, mind you, Kathy and I are used to being around young kids. We own a preschool, and so there's 100 kids running around us all day long. But they go home at six (laughs) o'clock. And we have grandkids in the area that we keep a lot. And on Friday nights, we usually keep them so that our kids can go out on a date night. But they're just here for about four hours, right? And it gets pretty wild on the Friday night, but it is that limited amount of time. It's more what I might call, instead of a disruption, a disturbance. Um, Webster's defines disturbance as an act or instance of the order of things being disturbed. And I promise you on Friday night, the order of things in our home is a little disturbed. And for a neat freak like me, I think it's just a great opportunity for the Holy Spirit to kind of do some transformational work (laughs) in my heart. But here's the deal. That's for one night. The other six nights, Kathy and I get to do what we want, how we want, where we want. We want to go, you know, uh, Shopping, hey, let's go. We want to go out to eat? Come on. Do you want to sit down and watch a Netflix show? Turn it on. So Friday nights really are just a blip on the continuum of the normal of our lives, of what we get to do, what we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it. It really is just a disturbance. But that week of spring break, that was a disruption. And our little disruptor was with us 24-7. Actually, 24 8, but who's counting? 192 straight hours. And again, it was a disruption in the best sense of the word. It'll, it'll go down as one of the top weeks for us of 2024. We loved every minute of it. But going back to the definition, an interruption in the normal course of your activity, when you have an eight month old living in your home, you will have an interruption in the normal course of your everyday activity. It will change what you do. You don't get to sleep through the night anymore. You don't get to sleep late in the morning anymore. Or at least that's what I was told by my wife when I woke up at my regular time. Um, (laughs) It changes where you go, right? You don't go out to a nice restaurant to eat. You don't go uh, to the movies. You know where we went? We went to the Fort Worth Zoo during spring break on Wednesday, which was half price day. And... (laughs) Let's just say it lived up to its name. It was a zoo that day. Uh, It took 30 minutes just to get in the parking lot. We had a wagon, we had a a stroller, and we were like this, jam-packed, going through, trying to see things. And I mean, I ended ended up envying the chimpanzees because they had way more room on their side of the fence than we had on our side of the fence. 
But it changes what you do, where you go. It changes how you speak. For an entire week, our house, the adults in our house, talked in baby talk. Like, come here, little, you're going to see your little pop pop, right? <laughs> it, because it disrupts everything. It just changes everything. And 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus came to this planet to be a disruptor, to disrupt our normal course of everyday activity that we call our life. And over these past few weeks, We've been, during Lent, looking at the book of Colossians, chapter 3, 1 through 17, thinking about what this new life looks like that Jesus came to bring. And the very first week, Barry reminded us that we have this new identity in Christ and that Christ came to give us, look how it's worded in Colossians 3, 1, since you have been raised to new life with Christ. We, he came to bring us a whole new life, not to tweak our old life, not to give us a little bit different life, not to give us a little bit better life. He came to give us a whole new life, to disrupt everything. And so we've talked about what that looks like over these past weeks, that we're to die to ourselves, that we're to take off things like, uh, that belong to our earthly nature, things like sexual immorality and evil desires and greed and anger and slander and filthy language. All of that goes away. And then we're reminded that we are chosen and we are dearly loved and we've been set apart. And so because of that, we want to put on the things of Christ, right? We put on compassion and, and kindness and humility and gentleness and peace. It says we put on love. Sissy talked about last week that the peace of Christ will reign in our hearts. The word of God will dwell within us and we use it as a guide. This is the new life that we have been invited into. And I think most of us hear that and we think, sign me up for that. Are you kidding? A life of peace and, and kindness and love? That's the life that I want. But there was a second part to that first week in this series that you may not have even caught if you weren't paying really close attention. And I think this is the part that we get tripped up on. Because not only does it say that we've been raised to this whole new life, but it says this in verse four, and when Christ, who is your life, appears. See, in other words, this is a whole new life, but it involves your whole life. This is a 24-7 deal. This isn't just on Sundays. This isn't you get to do what you want to do six days a week and then honor me on Sunday. This isn't a disturbance. This is a total disruption. It affects everything. It affects your work life, your married life, your parenting life, your, your relationship life, your sexual life. It is all covered. Jesus came to disrupt every part of our lives. And so what we do changes and where we go changes and how we speak changes. And I think this is where we back up a little bit and get a little hesitant, like, oh, I'm not so sure about that, Jesus. I mean, I'll give you a little, I'll give you this part of my life, but I'm handling this area pretty well. Let me just take care of this over here, Jesus. Uh, I'll take care of my work life. I'm not, I'm not sure you really understand how the marketplace works today. I mean, I may have to do some things and say some things that, you might not approve of, so just look the other way. I'll take care of it. I promise you the end will justify the means. Or Jesus, let me handle my married life, right? You weren't even married. What do you know about marriage, right? This is a complicated relationship. This is a dance you have to do to make sure you've always got a leg up a little bit. So Jesus, I'll handle my marriage. Or, or really, you wanna oversee my sexuality, Jesus? This is 2024, Times have changed since you were here. It's all different now. I mean, most couples aren't even getting married. We're just, they're just living together. Everybody's doing it, Jesus. See, we wanna we want pick and choose what Jesus gets control of. And unfortunately, that's not the way that the whole lordship thing works. And it's what brings us to our text today as we're looking at how Paul wraps this whole thought up. And look what he says in verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, do it all. This is encompassing. This is all encompassing. This is your entire life. And notice he doesn't say do it in the name of your advisor, Jesus. Do it in the name of your counselor, Jesus. Do it in the name of your friend, Jesus. He says do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because if you call yourself a Christian, Jesus is Lord of your life. He is Lord of all, but he has complete reign and authority in your life as well. And what does it mean to do it in the name of the Lord Jesus? We say in the name of Jesus at the end of our prayers. Sometimes we just throw that out in the name of Jesus. What does that mean? 
Well, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean you just go do whatever you want to and then throw the tagline in, in the name of Jesus, and then it's okay whatever you just did, right? What it does mean is that whatever you do and whatever you say should always line up with the character of Jesus. And here's why. Because a person's name and a person's character are always linked together. You know this. Uh, one of the ways that corporations and businesses today merchandise their product, um, they've done it for years, is they get a well-known personality to use it and then endorse it. They want them to lend their name to the product, their reputation to whatever it is that they're trying to sell. Because businesses know how this works, right? They go find a person that the public likes or trusts or admires, and they say to them, hey, will you endorse our product? Will you say that you can't live without this product, that you love this product? And then when they do that, we look at those people and we think, well, if they love that product and if they're using that product, then I need to use that product. And so we drink Diet Coke because Taylor Swift drinks Diet Coke. Now, never mind that she's paid $26 million to drink Diet Coke. Heck, Coca-Cola Company, if you're watching, I will do it for free. If you'll just supply the Diet Cokes, I will endorse your product. But you know what? They're not asking me because nobody knows me. Nobody knows the name Craig, but you know what? They know the name Taylor Swift and that's what they're paying for. They want Taylor Swift to give her two thumbs up, to give her approval to that product. And what Paul is saying here is he's saying, look, in word or deed, whatever you say or do, you ought to do it with the approval of Jesus. The New Living Translation says it this way, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. So the question that Paul is asking here is, would Jesus sign his name to what I'm about to say or about to do? I'm about to say something. Hang on. Would Jesus endorse that? I'm about to do something, stop for just a minute. Would Jesus sign off on that? Would he do that? Am I doing what he would do? Am I saying what he would say? Am I mimicking him? And I use that word mimic on purpose because Paul over in Ephesians says this. He says, we are to imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. And that word imitate comes from the Greek word mimites. It's where we get our word mimic from and mime from. And that's what he's saying. You are to mimic Jesus. You're to do, and you know what mimic is? It just means you do and say what that person's doing. And look, the word imitate in English or imitation is not a you know, real positive word, I don't think. Um, you, you, sometimes it's translated follow in the New Testament. But when you think of imitation, when I say I'm about to give you an imitation something, I don't think you think, wow, how cool, I get an imitation. Probably doesn't impress you. If you've been to New York City, up and down the streets of New York, uh, you see them selling imitation stuff all the time, right? Louis Vuittons and Ray-Ban sunglasses and Rolex watches. And when Kathy and I were married early in our relationship, we went to New York and uh, she bought a Kate Spade purse there on the streets of New York. And she was so excited, we couldn't afford a real one. And so now she has this one that kind of looks like it. And we get home and we go out to eat with a couple friend of ours and she's showing it to this other lady and the lady's looking at it. And she said, can you believe I only paid this much for it? It's a Kate Spade purse. And, and she looked at it and she said, Kathy, I'm not sure this is a great imitation. Look at what the label says on it. Cade Spate, <laughs> not Kate Spade. It was a terrible imitation. And here's the problem with the call for us to imitate Christ. There's a lot of Christians out there doing really bad imitations of Jesus. So much so that many people just look at us and say, look, if that's what being a Christian is all about, I don't want any part of that. Because nobody is drawn to a bad copy of Jesus. Jeff Walling is a favorite speaker of mine. He's a professor out at Pepperdine University. And he talks about two ways that we often miss the boat when it comes to imitating Christ the way that Paul is calling us to here. And he says the first way is sometimes we confuse imitation with impersonation. Now, you know what an impersonator is, right? And this is probably gonna date me, but the first impersonator that came to my mind when I'm thinking of impersonators was Dana Carvey with the first George Bush. Do you remember him on Saturday Night Live? And he, you know, he was like, not gonna do it. Not, this is gonna good, good, not bad, good, not bad. And I'm, I'm doing a terrible imitation, but he was good at impersonating him. 
And what would he do? He would study George Bush. He would study his mannerisms and his tone and his voice. And then he would step up on a stage and he would do it the way that George Bush did it. But it was for a short period of time. And then he would step back off the stage and he would be Dana Carvey again, right? He would go live the life of Dana Carvey. He didn't become George Bush. And that's the problem when I try to just impersonate Jesus. Then Craig never has to become like Jesus. Uh, I can just learn the right words to say. I can just do some of the things that I think Jesus would do. And then I get to go live my life the way that I want to live my life. But people are watching us. And when we show up here on Sundays and we do our best Jesus impersonations, but then we go live however we want the rest of the week, the world sees right through that. And some of you are really good at impersonating Jesus. Just this morning, you pulled up in the car and there was chaos and you were yelling in the car at your kids or at your spouse and the door opens and right on cue, you step out. Come on, sweetheart, let's go to children's (laughs) church. We're gonna learn about Jesus's love. Or, hey, baby, will you hold my hands while we go into service together? (laughs) And here's the deal. If you try just to impersonate Jesus, you will eventually trip up and fail. Because as soon as somebody pushes your buttons, as soon as somebody hurts your feelings in some way, you're gonna lose it. It reminds me of Paul's words to Timothy when he said, look, in the last days, there will be people who, who have a form of godliness but they deny its power. And that's what impersonation really is. It's a form of godliness, but there's no power. You know, back in 2022, they did a survey of what people thought about Christians. And it's funny because Christians describe Christians with words like friendly and welcoming and warm. But non-Christians, non-religious people had a totally different view. Their number one description of Christians was hypocrite. Because when they see us acting like jerks out in public, yelling at the waiter because our order didn't come just the way that we wanted it to come, or we're using coarse language at work because everyone else is using coarse language, or we're giving the one finger wave to the car who's trying to cut in front of us on the highway, people see that. And is it any wonder they don't wanna have anything to do with that? They're like, look, I have seen my Christian boss at his worst, no thank you, I'm good. That's not imitating Christ. That's just impersonating Jesus. And then the second way he talks about that we mess up this whole uh, imitate thing with Jesus is sometimes we just choose to improv. You know what improvisation is, right? That's when you go off script. That's kind of when you make up your own stuff. You riff a little bit. Um, If you've ever been in theater or a musician, you kind of know what this is about. And there's musicians who can do a great job of of improvisation, right? It sounds great. You're just amazed at their work. But most of us cannot. And my middle son is an actor out in LA. And so I've been around a lot of theater. I've sat through a lot of play rehearsals. And let me tell you, when you're in a play rehearsal and you're working off of a script, nobody's looking for improv, because if you start improving, it throws everything else off. Nobody else knows how to respond because what you say influences what everyone else says and does and responds. You can't just start riffing in the middle of a play rehearsal. And the reason that improv doesn't work for us as Christians, well, think about Robin Williams, who I think was one of the greatest improv actors of all times. And he was the genie in Aladdin, the voice of the genie. And when they recorded uh, his voice, they had a script. And so he went into the sound booth with the script, but he started improv and making things up. And it was brilliant. And so here's what, how, how that went. He would improv something and it would be great. And so the writers would take the script and they would mark it through and they would change it to what he just said. And then the animators would take the the, the animation and they would change the animation to make those words come out of the genie. And so some of the funniest lines we get out of Aladdin were just his improv. The problem is that doesn't work with Jesus. And you know why? Because Jesus's script is done. It's finished. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your enemy. Turn the other cheek. Consider others more than yourself. See, most of us would never improv lines like that. Most of us, when we improv, we're like, hey, why were you just yelling at that group that walked by? 
because they need to know Jesus. I want them to know they're, you know, they're going to hell. They need to know Jesus. I think you might've gone off script just a little bit, just a tad. Or, or why did you just lie about that? That wasn't true, what you just said. Your kids were watching you. Why'd you make that up? Because, because it's just easier than having to explain the whole thing. Uh, I, I think you might've gone off script a little bit. And when we start improvising in Jesus' script, we mess up our witness. We mess up our influence. We are not representing the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a way that they handle that in the theater. In the theater, when you have your rehearsals and, and you forget your line, you don't improvise. Again, that would mess up the whole thing. Um, and uh, there, the way that you do it, and the best of actors know how to do this. Um, a couple years ago, our middle son that's out in LA got a guest starring role on the TV show, Mom. Um, and so it was exciting. He invited us to come out and watch the live taping. And I was excited because I'm a big fan of Alice and Janney and Anna Ferris. And so to get to see these professionals at work. And, and it was funny. What happened more often than you might think on that set is these actors forgot their lines. Now, what did they do? Well, what they didn't do is they didn't just start making it up. Even though they knew the story, even though they kind of knew how this was supposed to play out, they didn't just make up their next line. They would stop. And they would look over and say, line. And there would be a production person over in the corner who would had the script and would read the line to them. And then they would hear it and then they would repeat it and filming would start again. So here's an idea for you for the next time that you're tempted to go off script. Next time you're angry and you're about to speak some words that are not in the name of the Lord Jesus, what if you just stopped and with the power of the Holy Spirit Set in your mind, Jesus, line. <laughs> Kathy and I have been putting this into practice around our house lately, and I gotta tell you, it's a game changer. It works great, because more often than I would like to admit, I might say something that didn't quite come out the way I intended, that might hurt her feelings, that could lead to some sort of argument, and now she just smiles at me and says, Jesus, line. <laughs> and occasionally I have to do it back to her, the problem is when I do it, typically the, the, the sense I get back from Jesus is, hey, Craig, how about you just not say anything, right? <laughs> how about this is what you're doing, this is what I need you to do, okay? <laughs> not the, or if you really think you need to say something, how about just, I'm sorry, it was my fault. And I'm like, are you sure, Jesus, that wasn't her line? Um, <laughs> is no, no, Craig, that's your line. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, Kathy, it was my fault. So you never make up lines like that, do you? Those are the ones Jesus has to give you because it's Jesus who, who lived this life that was so counter to culture that it would never occur to him to shame another person. It would never occur to him to take advantage of somebody just because you're in a position of authority. It would never occur to him to lie because that's the, easy, the easier route to take. You remember the script? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But, but I just think Jesus would want me to be true to myself, right? Uh, that's, is, is, so, so that's why you just said what you said? Yeah, I mean, you know, come on, you gotta be true to yourself. What would you want me to do, just not say anything? Well, there's an idea. How about not let everything that comes through your head come out your mouth? I think Jesus might say that. How about don't be quick to anger, but slow to speak? And when they nailed him to the cross, you remember the line from the script? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I think we probably need to memorize that one. So that next time somebody lets you down or lets you have it and you want to come back at them hard, what if you just stopped? Jesus, line? And that line might just be a silent prayer. Will you just forgive them, Jesus? They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't mean it. And will you help me forgive them too? And it's just so simple when I say it, isn't it? But when you think about that person in your life, whoever that person is, maybe they're sitting next to you and you just wanna look over and go, this is gonna be tough, right? This is gonna be hard. I love a line by Charles Stanley who once said, hey, your job, just obey God. Leave the consequences to him. You just obey God. You just do what he did. You say what he said, and then you let him handle the rest. And it's not easy because more often than not, we just want to go with our gut, right? We want to go with how we feel. I just feel like doing this, or I feel like saying that. 
It reminds me of Paul's words over in the Philippians when, in Philippians when he says, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God, catch this, their God is their stomach. They have the gut God. My feelings will rule over me and they will guide me and they will direct me. Can I just tell you, your gut doesn't make a very good God. So again, just obey, stay on script, imitate Christ and leave the rest to him. You remember from the 90s, the whole WWJD thing? Start asking the question, what would Jesus do? And by the way, that didn't actually start in the 90s. That started back in 1896. There was a book published back then called In His Steps, written by a guy named Charles Sheldon. It was the story of a pastor in the Midwest who challenged his congregation and said, for the next year, before you make any decision, before you enter into any transaction, before you do any action, I want you to filter it through this question, what would Jesus do? And the book goes on to show how this whole church community was transformed and eventually how their whole city community was transformed. And then in 1990, there was a youth pastor up in Michigan who caught on to that idea and wanted her youth group to remember it. And so she came up with the idea to make a bracelet that said WWJD. And it started this grassroots movement that spread around the world. What would Jesus do? And I think John Mark Comer makes a good point in his new book, uh, Practicing the Way, when he said, WWJD is a really good question to ask, but maybe a better question is WWJD IHWM, meaning what would Jesus do if he were me? Because nobody in this room is a first century celibate Jewish rabbi, right? You're a 21st century mom or student or business person or teacher or construction worker. And sometimes it can be hard to relate. But what if we started asking, how would Jesus live if he had my gender, if he had my ethnicity, if he had my personality profile, my age, my life stage, my job, my resources, my address, how would he show up to the world today if he were me? How would he handle this situation, whatever this situation is for you right now? And then in light of that, Paul says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then he finishes this whole line of thought with these beautiful words, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Such an important end to this whole passage that as we consider the links that Jesus went, what it cost him for us to experience this new life, there ought to be this underlying sense of gratitude in our hearts. James 1 says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. God has given us so much. He's given us his Holy Spirit to convict us and to comfort us and to guide us and, and to, to go through life with us. He's given us the word of God to direct our lives. He's given us his word. He's given us this supernatural peace that just passes all human understanding. But most importantly of all, he gave us his only son, his son, Jesus, the great disruptor, the great rescuer, the savior of the world, the one we will celebrate in his, who's victorious over sin and death next weekend. Every good thing we have comes from God. And we ought to approach, approach life with a heart of gratitude. John Ortberg says this, gratitude is the ability for us to experience life as a gift. It opens us up to wonder and delight and humility. It liberates us from the prison of self-preoccupation. Does your life, do your words reflect a heart of gratitude to your God? Well, our spring disruption ended uh, a week ago Saturday as Kathy and I stood out on the front yard and waved goodbye to our little disruptor and his parents and they drove back to San Antonio. And the minute they drove off, we went inside and we collapsed on the couch and I think we slept for two or three hours. But in my half comatose state, I just had this sense of gratitude that we had just lived the greatest adventure. It was so much fun. And I actually learned some lessons along the way. Lessons like life is messy. Because when you have an eight-month-old in your house, it gets messy. And just a side note, I don't know when parents decided, you know, in our generation, the way we fed our babies is we got a jar of baby food and we held the spoon and we dipped in it and we put it in their mouth and then we pulled it back out nice and clean the way God intended. <laughs> but nowadays, you young parents just cut up avocados and strawberries and lay them out on the plate and your child grabs them like they're monkeys. 
And about a third of it goes on the floor and the rest of it, you know, on the ceiling and maybe two bites go in your mouth. It's messy, but that's total another conversation. Uh, I also learned that having control, just an illusion. I learned that it's not all about me. All pretty good lessons for a 62-year-old geezer like myself who's pretty set in his ways. But overall, I was just grateful that we got to experience this beautiful interruption in the normal course of our everyday routine we call life. What a blessing. And in the same way, when we allow our God to totally disrupt our lives, when we submit everything to his lordship, everything we say, everything we do, and we do life in him and with him and for him the way it was intended to be lived, look, you may not end up getting to do everything that you wanted to do, and your life may take a path that you never would have planned for yourself, but I can promise you this, you will learn some valuable lessons along the way. Lessons like life, this life can be really messy, and control is just an illusion. And this life is not all about you. But more importantly, I hope that you will learn that you have a heavenly father that you can trust and who loves you, who is crazy about you, who loves you more than you will ever know. And my prayer for all of us is that when we get to the end of our life, we will have imitated Christ to the best of our ability with the help of the Holy Spirit so that we can look back with a heart full of gratitude, no regrets, recognizing Jesus just took me on the most awesome adventure, the adventure of a lifetime. So may we leave here today committed that in everything we do, whether in word or deed, we will do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen.